Empty your minds. Be formless, shapeless, like water. Water can flow. Water can crash. Be like water. Be a monk. Greetings, disciples. My name is Monty Martin. And I am Kelly McLaughlin. And, and we, we are, are the Dungeon, Dungeon Dudes. Dudes. Today we're taking a look at the Monk class in Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition. We're going to show you everything your monk needs to know to master body, mind, and spirit. We'll look at the key ability scores, build options, and class features, everything you need to know to play a monk in Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition. We're also going to get you inspired by looking at some famous monks from history, television, film, books, and we're also going to look at role-playing options to get you inspired for your next monk. With that, let's get rolling. Well, Kelly, why would we want to play a monk? The monk is the classic martial artist. They're all hands, fists, kicking, and they're great in combat for skirmishing and all sorts of other things. They really come in with flying fists. Oh yeah. You get to feel like you've got the grace, the agility, the unarmored combat styles uh, that really make the monk a cinematic character to play. Yeah, they're, they're kind of that, that typical kung fu master, but they can be played in a number of different ways. And really, you get to run in, you get to be anywhere you want to on the battlefield. They're fast, they're fierce, and they're dangerous. Yeah, it really takes agility to a whole other level. And you also get this really interesting spiritual and mental discipline that comes from playing a monk that gives you all sorts of really interesting role-playing options. I think that martial artists are some of the most inspiring and interesting people in the real world. And in playing a monk, you get to embrace all this really great philosophy, this striving to better yourself, body and mind, and the focus that comes from being a determined uh, goal seeker, um, no matter what your monk's quest is. The monk can also harness uh, the key or chi of their body to deliver these crazy powerful abilities. Yeah, you can empower your key to help you master your body, making a flurry of strikes, moving with unearthly agility, or even sending shocks rippling through your opponent's bodies. There's so many things to love about playing a monk. What do you think are some of the best things? Uh, your ability to be both stealthy, um, a fierce combatant, mm -hmm. as well as, um, I don't know, just the, the cinematic nature of their fighting. I find that describing the monks fighting styles is always one of my favorite things to do uh, with yeah. their mobility, their ability to flip around the battlefield. Make roundhouse kicks to the face. I love my roundhouse yeah, kicks. Absolutely. Um, and what's cool about it is that your monk could be everything from a street fighter to a shadowy assassin to a brutal drunken master. They could be a wrestler or someone that really puts the art in martial artist. No matter the way, I think all monks really look at the ways that they can hone their body, mind, and spirit to the razor's edge and bring them to a whole other level of expertise in battle. So let's look at the monk's role in the party. Wow, so the monk is a really interesting skirmisher. Combatant. Yeah, their their attacks aren't as strong as some of the other combat-based uh, classes. Mm -hmm. However, the fact is they usually get more attacks than a lot of these and a lot of maneuverability. It's amazing. A monk can pretty much go anywhere, be anywhere on the battlefield because they are so fast and have so much mobility. Um, but more so than that, they've actually got some really interesting and potent techniques for controlling the battlefield too move anywhere, be anywhere, attack any way you want. Um, they're really good for cleaning up small enemies or landing a whole bunch of hits on a big target. Yeah, and because they're so mobile, that actually carries over to their usefulness in exploration as well. They make great scouts because they're so stealthy, uh, thanks to their high dexterity scores, typically. Um, and you kind of get this amazing ability to navigate through the environment because you can leap in great distances, uh, which is really quite parkour-inspired. Yes, I love uh, doing parkour with my monk. I love uh, getting up to on top of trees or on top of hills. I like being the scout, 
as mm -hmm. a monk. It's just uh, kind of the one thing that I feel like I'm very strong at when we're exploring is being able to run ahead. And because of that speed, I can run ahead, scout, run back before anybody even notices I'm gone. Yeah. And in social interactions, monks often are interesting contemplative mystics. Yeah. Right? But in this sense, they're really more of a blank slate than anything else. And there's so many different directions that you can take a monk. You don't necessarily have to be the Shaolin-inspired martial artist that came down from a temple. Um, my monk's an assassin, a trained assassin, who was taught the art of monk skills and fighting and to channel his key uh, to assassinate his targets. Yeah, and at the same time, your monk is a noble. Yeah. Right, which is a complete subversion of that and actually has a level of social responsibility. So as soon as you kind of break the mold of what a monk can be and look at them more as a martial artist, which can come from any walk of life, there's really no limit to where your monk can be in terms of role playing and interactions. So let's talk about getting inspired for a monk. Well, I mean, martial arts have been a part of human history and tied to human culture all over the world for thousands of years. And the monk class itself draws deep inspirations from many of the um, Eastern Asian traditions of martial arts um, and from monasteries that formed in that part of the world. That said, the modern monk in a lot of ways is more inspired by the Shaolin martial arts films that were themselves inspired by that part of history than the actuality of what was going on in the world at that time. Yeah, when I think of the monks within the realm of D&D, &D, I tend to think of things like Bruce Lee, Jackie Chan, Chuck Norris, those uh, classic martial artists who were on the screen when I was younger, just kicking so much butt. Yeah, and even beyond that, there's so many amazing animes that, have mar that feature martial artists and have some awesome uh, things there. I think Goku and Dragon Ball is a huge inspiration for the monk class. Films like Fist of the North Star, or maybe a more comedic take like One Punch Man. Yeah. Another one that I would argue is a monk, and actually the main inspiration for a lot of my monks um, kind of backstory, is Batman. And I, yeah. I know there, there, there is the argument to be made that he's taken a few levels of rogue, but if you want to look at the shadow monk... Uh, really in tune with Batman, especially the Nolan films. The Take Nolan off. films? Yeah. He went to yeah. a temple in the mountains. He trained in martial arts. Yep. He learned how to be that, that shadowy assassin who like is one with the darkness and lashes out with his fists and a few mm. little gadgets and things. And uh, that's how he does his combat. Speaking of assassins, there is no more greater than the bride from Quentin Tarantino's Kill Bill films. Uma Thurman kicks ass in that movie. The moves are incredibly inspiring, super, super bloody, and a fantastic example of a monk who has learned these moves and abilities, but has their own motivation uh, based on revenge that is far less peaceful and contemplative than you would otherwise have from a monk. That scene in Kill Bill where she takes on the crazy 88, oh my God. Uh, that is like such a here's a hero character yeah. versus a bunch of um, goons. But she is merciless in that respect. Oh, yeah. And she definitely has the number of attacks to take down 88 guys. <laughs> yeah. I would also say, you know, monks um, are often also associated with the Jedi Knights. From Star Wars. Now we've talked about how the Jedi are kind of this weird paladin monk hybrid, but particularly in some of the newer films, characters like Rey are much closer to a monk in their take towards their fighting style uh, and their origins than they are to, say, a paladin. I also want to mention the Ninja Turtles. Oh my god. Uh, which are all monks using yep. all sorts of cool monk weapons, and uh, you actually have four perfect archetypes for, for, monk, for yeah. different backstories and different ways to you role play. You have the leader, the brains, the angry one, and the fun-loving one. Yeah. Uh, and then you can even look at, like, Master Splinter is such a great pastiche of all those old martial arts masters, although ends up being a really unique and endearing character in his own right. I, man, that brings me back to my childhood. Like, Ninja Turtles, yeah. real close to my heart. A turtle monk? Totally. I would play a turtle monk. So let's jump in and actually look at how we might build our monk. 
We're going to start with a quick overview of the core class features of the monk because it's pretty key to understand those before we jump into why we actually might want to make some certain choices with our monks. Yeah, one, one thing to keep in mind with the monks is they have a large array of abilities uh, going mm -hmm. on on the character sheet. There's a lot of things that you can do on your turn. But once you kind of get the hang of the flow of what you can and can't do, uh, it becomes pretty straightforward to know how you yeah. want to play your monk. And once you make your small choices that you need to make along the way, um, it really kind of starts to, to fill in and you start to understand what you need to do. Exactly. Um, so starting off, the monks are a class with a D8 hit die. Yeah, and they don't wear any armor, and we're going to talk about why in a moment. Monks gain proficiency with simple weapons and short swords, and for skills, they get to choose two from acrobatics, athletics, insight, history, religion, and stealth. Plus, they also get to choose a musical instrument or an artisan's tool. Finally, monks are proficient in strength and dexterity saving throws. So going back to them not wearing any armor, we're going to talk about their unarmored defense. This is one of the key abilities that make up why the monk is so cool with not wearing armor. Yeah, the unarmored defense ability allows you to calculate your AC as 10 plus your dexterity modifier plus your wisdom modifier, as long as you aren't using any armor or using a shield either. Now, we've gone into this in other um, other episodes of our show, but one thing to keep in mind with this is if you are playing a lizard folk or, or, a, you're tortle. Using, or a tortle or you're using mage armor or something like that. Or you gain the unarmored defense class feature from some other class. You only get to make one calculation for your AC. So if you are using the, the monk's unarmored defense, and then, someone casts mage armor on you, your AC wouldn't be 13 plus your dexterity plus your wisdom. You'd either choose 13 plus your dexterity or 10 plus your dexterity plus your wisdom. Yeah. The next major class feature for the monk is their martial arts class feature. If we look at the monk as body, mind, and soul, this is very much the body of the monk class. So one of the coolest parts about the martial arts is that you get to use what's called a monk weapon. And the monk weapon can be any short sword or simple weapon that isn't two-handed or heavy. And by using a monk weapon, you get to use your dexterity in place of strength to determine the attack bonus of that weapon. So also applies to the damage modifiers as well, but it only works with monk weapons when you're not wearing armor or using a shield. As soon as you pick up a shield, you lose this benefit. And that's why it works very well with the unarmored defense. Exactly. The next feature is that you're allowed to use a D4 in place of the regular damage die for your unarmed strikes as well as attacks made with your monk weapons. This might not seem too impressive at first, but this actually grows as your monk levels up. And so by the time you are a very high level monk, you're actually using a D10 for your fists and that D6 short sword becomes a D10 as well. The interesting thing about this is that even though you're restricted from using two-handed weapons, you can still use versatile weapons in two hands, which means that you can use a quarter staff uh, with all these features in two hands and get that D8 damage die much earlier than you would when martial weapons levels up. You also can use your bonus action as a monk to perform an unarmed strike. So when you make an attack on your turn, you can make another attack with your unarmed strike as a bonus action. Yeah, you must have taken the attack action on your turn to use the bonus action attack. Uh, and again, it doesn't work if you're wearing armor or using a shield. And finally, this actually overrides any other benefits that you as a monk might get from two weapon fighting. So if you're wielding two short swords, it doesn't actually matter. Um, and it's not subject to the normal restrictions of wielding two weapons. Um, because you get to apply your full uh, ability modifier to the damage roll. And even if you're using an item in two hands, because it's made with your unarmed strike, it can be a punch or a kick or a headbutt or a knee. It does, it, so if you've got something in your hands already, you're not precluded from making these attacks. So let's talk about another one of the monk's coolest abilities, and that is their key. This is the mind and the soul of the monk. Yeah, so we have the body. Now we're looking at the mind and the soul. The key is a bunch of points that you get. And as you level up, you get more key points to spend to enhance your abilities. 
You also get your key points when er back whenever you finish a short rest, which means you're often going to have a very big pool of these abilities to use in almost every combat encounter. Some of your key abilities require the target to make a saving throw, and the DC is determined by using 8 plus your proficiency bonus plus your wisdom modifier. Yeah, this comes into play for a couple cool abilities that monks gain from their subclasses, but also a core class feature we're going to talk about in a moment. But the most common thing you're going to be using your key points for is the Flurry of Blows. Flurry of Blows essentially lets you add an additional attack onto your unarmored attack when you make that bonus action. Yeah, so Flurry of Blows allows you to spend one key point after you make the attack action on your turn to then make two attacks with your bonus action. This kind of overrides the normal one attack that you get to make, so I kind of like to think about it as spending one key point to make an extra attack, but that's not what the rule actually is. It's quite literally spend a key point to make two attacks with your bonus action. So make sure that you know this if you want to do other things with your turn because you still need to attack to make a flurry of blows. Um, what's really cool about this is once you hit level five and you get that extra attack feature, you're now making four attacks per turn. The flurry of blows is always awesome when it's described as you doing something truly amazing with your martial arts expertise. Let's talk about my favorite ability that a monk gets, and that is Stunning Strike. This is such an amazing ability and probably the defining feature of the monk. Yeah. Basically how it works is starting at 5th level, when you hit an enemy with an attack made with a monk weapon or unarmed strike, you can immediately spend one key point to force the target to make a constitution saving throw against your key uh, saving throw DC. If they fail, they're stunned until the end of your next turn. I love that it's the end of your next turn because that means that no matter what, you're at least going to get that next turn to pummel them with punches with it's advantage. So Not only that, but the rest of your party will all get to pummel that target and with advantage. And they lose their turn, too. Yeah, yeah. so it's, it's just a really cool ability and can really change the tides of battle. I've kind of wrecked entire combat encounters we went to fight a dragon once, and I stunning striked it. And it was pretty much Landed over. it, yeah. and that was it for that dragon. This is a really powerful ability, because there's no restrictions on the number of times per turn you can use stunning strike. If you want to spend flurry of blows and then spend four more key points to stun four different targets, or make one target make four saving throws against it, you can do that. And this means that if a monk wants to lock a target down, they pretty much can, because if you have to make four constitution saving throws, eventually you're going to flub one of those rolls and get like a two or a five or less. And even if you have like a plus 10 saving throw modifier, you're stunned. <laughs> yeah. As the monk levels up, you're going to get to use your key points to increase things like your movement speed and a bunch of other stuff too. Yeah, your uh, specific monastic tradition will give you extra things that you can do with your key points. And as monks gain levels, they do get a few additional cool defensive features like uh, inbuilt fast movement, which makes them so speedy. They get um, evasion and additional proficiencies in saving throws and even the ability to reroll saving throws as well. Monks get a really great core package that is a cr uh, consistent across all the different disciplines. So let's talk about ability scores. Um, I think that if you are playing a monk and you've looked at all of the abilities that we've talked about, I want to say dexterity's got to be your highest. I think everything kind of drives you towards having a high dexterity score because it'll be your primary attack stat. Um, all of the features are driven towards it. The martial arts feature, the unarmored defense, all say have a high dexterity. Wisdom's your second most important ability score because not only does it tie into um, your unarmored defense, but it also gives you those scouting abilities, perception, things yeah. like that as well. And honestly, you want that high saving throw DC against your stunning strike because it is the defining ability for the monk class. And you'll probably also want a good constitution score as well as a melee combatant that will take a few hits. Yeah, the one thing is, as a melee combatant, a D8 hit dice is not the strongest. Yeah. So having that constitution as your third option uh, might help just keep you in the fray a little bit longer. Yeah. Um, at the same time, there are some people that make a pretty convincing case for a strength-based monk. Uh, and there's some pretty cool ways to make this work. The other ability scores are really going to be based on how you want to roleplay your monk. 
If your monk is more of a hermit who secluded themselves away from society, you might not think charisma is very important. Uh, and you might want to think about, like, maybe your monk is a philosopher and values scholarship, so they want to have a good intelligence score. Having the charisma score also helps you to be a little bit more boastful and arrogant and yeah. kind of stand up in those social situations, um, which is something that I like to do. Yeah, I think if you're going to do the traditional, like, grew up in a monastery archetype, intelligence is the, the role-playing stat you want to go for. And if you want to do the more gritty street fighter, like, learn their own skills and is more closer to a rogue, go with a higher charisma score if you can get it. They're yeah. probably both going to be pretty low. Yeah, they're, they're both going to be yeah. the lowest. So what races are best for playing a monk? Uh, well, anything with a dexterity and wisdom bonus is going to be a great place to start. So this means wood elves are really potent. Yeah, wood elf monks. Yep, and you get a choice. little bit of extra speed behind it. Uh, wood elves also just seem like the type that might have like a monastery in a treetop village. Right? Like that's a cool idea. Um, surprisingly, halflings... Uh, stout halflings also make a really good option for monks because they have a dexterity bonus, a constitution bonus, uh, and they get the lucky features. Which, uh, which is handy. Yeah, I think it's it's really cool. Um, halflings are kind of unexpected for a monk, but the disadvantages of being small don't really apply to a monk because you're not going to be using heavy weapons anyways. Yeah. Um, variant human is uh, the one that I went with, and I mean, yeah. here you get to choose a feat off the bat. Uh, variant humans are just well-rounded in that sense. Yeah, I actually don't think that monks are too of a feat-hungry class, because monks can't really take advantage of feats like Great Weapon Master or Sharpshooter. Yeah. But you can still get to pick up a great feat like Mobile or Magic Initiate or Alert to give you a little bit of an extra perk off the top. What about the Hill Dwarf? Uh, the Hill Dwarf... Interesting because it's a uh, constitution and a wisdom bonus. I love the idea of a dwarf monk. I don't know. There's something just cool about it. Yeah, it's something that's like a little bit out of the ordinary. You yeah. usually picture them with heavy armor and war hammers. But having that guy with like the, the bandages wrapped around his hand yeah, running yeah. out with his big beard and beating guys I may, up. It would make a great drunken master. Yeah. Right? Um, and if we're really going to subvert the expectations, but in a way we're not. Going into Volo's Guide to Monsters uh, and all the stuff in Xanathar's Guide to Everything, the Turtle, Play your Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle. Yeah. Right? Um, and now the Turtle's interesting because they get a strength bonus. So, but they already get that huge AC. Yeah, so you have to kind of pick and choose which, which AC. If I use. was doing a Turtle Monk, I would just have a high strength score and I wouldn't worry about it. Because the Turtle yeah. already gets the AC. Yeah, exactly. Cool. Right? It's, it actually is like a perfect match in a lot of ways. And I love that that works. I really want to play Donatello. <laughs> is Donatello your favorite? Uh, Donatello is my favorite. I like Donatello. I really, I mean, growing up, I loved Leonardo, but everyone did. I liked Raphael when I was a little yeah, kid. Now yeah, I like Donatello. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> if your DM is going to let you play an Aarakocra, especially at low levels, uh, it's kind of amazing because you get flight. And yeah. just a flying... Like, it really brings a new meaning to flying roundhouse kick. So one of the biggest choices that you're going to make as your monk is your monastic tradition. Yeah, and there's a bunch of these. There's three in the Player's Handbook and three in Xanathar's Guide to Everything. Uh, and your choice of your monastic tradition is going to give you a new class feature at 3rd level, 6th level, 11th level, and then a capstone at 17th level. And most of these are going to give you new ways to use your key points and a couple kind of supernatural abilities to augment your monk's abilities. Yeah. The ones in the player's handbook, we have Way of the Shadow, Way of the Open Fist, and Way of the Four Elements. And in Xanathar's Guide to Everything, we have the Way of the Drunken Master, the Way of the Kensai, and the Way of the Sun Soul. And then there was one also included in the Sword Coast Adventures Guide. Yeah, which is the Way of the Long Death. So let's start with uh, my personal favorite, uh, the Way of the Shadow. The classic ninja. Yeah, this this is what turns your character into a ninja. You get really cool things like some spells that you can cast. Such yeah, you as can cast darkness. Darkness, dark vision. Pass, uh, with pass a without trace, trace. And minor illusion. Minor illusion, which is can be really yeah. fun. Uh, not something you would expect from a monk. Um, probably my favorite ability, though, is the shadow step. It is so useful, and it's just a massive augmentation to the monk's um, ability. I find it really funny though, uh, Kelly's playing a shadow monk in our current campaign and periodically we'll be having an outdoor combat encounter and he'll ask me, 
So how high is the sun in the sky? Which way are the shadows coming from? Uh, and I love this because it just adds a completely different direction to the uh, the battlefield when you have to think about the lighting conditions because the monk is going to teleport from one shadow to the next. Um, the other high level ability they get is the ability to turn invisible uh, as an action when they're in an area of shadow, yeah. which is super, super useful as well. Um, the next one is the way of the four elements. And if you're looking for like an Avatar The Last Airbender inspired monk or your Goku option, I think this is pretty much your ticket because you're going to gain the ability to spend key points to cast a very limited number of spells. Yeah, but they're all elemental based spells. Yeah. So you really do get these these cool ways of like like The Last Airbender of yeah. manipulating the world around you to really deliver those attacks. Yeah, you uh, will eventually gain the ability to cast spells like Thunder Wave and Burning Hands but eventually Fireball, Fly, Wall of Fire, uh, and Cone of Cold uh, comes online as well. Uh, and then next up we have the Way of the Open Fist. Probably the most popular. It's it's the, the quintessential martial artist. It really is, uh, and it augments your Flurry of Blows. When you make a Flurry of Blows attack, you get to add an extra effect to the targets that you hit with your Flurry of Blows, like knocking them prone, pushing them back. It's a great always on ability um, that I think just really makes the monk into a battlefield controller more so than they already are with Stunning Strike. Yeah. Yeah, right? Like, I love this idea of coming up to somebody, flurry of blowsing, stunning striking them, knocking them back 15 feet, and knocking them prone. Now they're just screwed. Yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, that's one way yeah. to take out a target. Yeah. Um, the other thing that they get, the high level ability, the level 17 one, Quivering Palm, it's the five finger, Ex yeah, exploding. the five finger exploding heart technique. Yeah. Like, <laughs> um, I, I, like just the ability to reduce somebody immediately to zero hit points with it, or make them take, I think it's ten d ten damage, even if they succeed yeah. their saving throw. It's a vicious ability, pretty appropriate for level seventeen. Yeah, yeah. So, how about the drunken master? Um, I think this is a wonderful and flavorful subclass. Unfortunately, until the level 17 ability that lets you make three additional attacks on top of your regular Flurry of Blows comes online, it really feels kind of lackluster, although it's going to be one that's so fun to roleplay, and I would totally play a Dwarven Drunken Master mode. Yeah, I feel the same way uh, about the Kensai as well. The, the Kensai is a cool one because you get to add... Um, weapons that are normally not on the monk list to your list of monk weapons. Yeah. Um, and you gain a bunch of abilities that then let you augment those, including the ability to treat a longbow as a monk weapon. Um, this is really cool, but I still feel like it competes too much with Flurry of Blows. Like a lot of the abilities, you have to use a bonus action to augment the weapon strike that you make with the Kensai weapon. So again, it's cool to represent like if you want to see your monk using a long sword or like a katana type weapon rather than like a short sword, which is typically regarded as like an offhand sort of weapon um, or like the Zen archer. Yeah. Um, but again, I think it lacks the potency that we see in the other ones. Once again, really cool idea. Um, just doesn't have as much of a punch, yep. pun intended, yep. as the player's handbook. The final one is the way of the sun soul uh, in Xanathar's Guide to Everything. And the sun soul is pretty cool because it lets you make a special magical laser attack with in, instead of um, making an unarmed strike. Monks with lasers. It, well, it kind of like, you know in Dragon Ball, there those moments where they fire like all of the little energy blasts in quick succession instead of the big Kamehameha? Yeah. This is basically what I think it's meant to create. Like it's the key blast sort of ability or the Hadouken. You know, the monk has so much mobility as it stands that the ranged attack doesn't quite stand out in the same way that it would otherwise. And what about the uh, the option from Sword Coast Adventure Guide, the uh, the way of the long death? Great concept, but terrible execution. Yeah. Yeah, this is a, it's really forgettable. It feels like all of its abilities are either weaker than the way of the open hand or weaker than the uh, Shadow Monk. I mean, check it out, see if you like it, but not our favorite. Yeah.
So let's talk about role-playing our monk. And I'm sure I have a lot to say about this because I'm currently playing a monk. Yeah, who is a very interesting character, I must say. Yeah, I mean, some of the questions that you need to ask yourself when you're creating a monk is, um, where did you learn your abilities? Was it from a temple? Was it from a monk mm. order? Um, and like, what does the power of key mean to you? Yeah, because it's portrayed as a spiritual force, but it could be be supernatural it could represent the connection between all things but it could just be as much an inner wellspring of power that you look into that gives you focus um and not all monks need to have necessarily that monastic discipline that is often associated with the class calic certainly doesn't have that calic was kicked out of the monk temple because he was too reckless and arrogant mm -hmm. and that's why that was my excuse for why he was a level one character yeah is he went to the monk traditions he went started to learn the ways of the shadow monk and then they were like you're awful like get out of here so then he went to party with his friends and then ended up in, on an adventure where he's now learning yeah. those skills along the way there's, there's just so many movies about people like fighting on the streets, right? Um, and learning all these abilities through their own honed um, body in the name of survival. Yeah. Right? Um, and a lot of those um, traditions of martial arts come out of personal self-defense. Maybe your character is an urchin or a criminal and they have nothing. And they didn't even have enough to learn how to have a sword or a dagger to learn sneak attack and become a rogue which is why they just got to fight with their fists. And over time, they develop those skills, right? Yeah, the other thing is like almost, uh, there's a large number of superheroes that are all yeah. fist to like hand-to-hand yeah. -hand combat. Um, that's that's very much in tune with the monk. I still think I'm going to play a, a, a turtle monk that grew up in the sewers of Waterdeep and loves pizza. I mean, you, <laughs> yeah, yes. Um, as a matter of fact, I really think that we need to have a campaign uh, where we have four uh, yeah. turtle monks. Yeah, they want to overcome their own faults and flaws. And martial artists recognize that they have issues with anger. They have issues with rage. They have all these flaws with maybe they're a drunken master and they're addicted to alcohol. And they turn to their martial art as a means of coping with those things. And so I think that's a really interesting way to spin a monk character that actually you have your flaws and you turn to your chi as a way of processing that as a character, right? Um, and that's a fantastic way to role play. So I, I, I think having a monk that's inspired like Raphael from the Ninja Turtles that has a ton of anger and rage and needs to get it out, right? And is trying to figure out a way to navigate that. It's such a, yeah. Your monk can disappear for many, many years on a personal quest only to find like you know the your brother that you trained with at the monastery has fallen into evil ambitious ways and is now like a proto shredder <laughs> right so finding all those ways to like manage your monk's backstory really there, there's so much here with this character uh and i think that just the idea of the monk being like just that contemplative mystic who was raised in a monastery and is all about like peace and has an oath of silence and doesn't say anything it's very limiting, but when you start looking at monks as people that are trying to overcome their flaws through their martial arts training, you really get into a rich character that's a great one to play in a D&D campaign. So this has been our guide to the monk class in Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition. May your path for inner peace remind you that forgiveness is divine, but never pay full price for late pizza. We have so many awesome martial arts films that we talked about when we were looking at the Monk Guide, and we would love to know your recommendations for awesome movies to check out. Or just tell us who your favorite Ninja Turtle is. Tell us in the comments below. If you want to check out some of our other class guides, you can find our playlist right up over here. And of course, monks are always looking for ways to improvise in combat, so check out our guide to actions in combat right up over here. Please subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an episode. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next time in, in the, the Dungeon. dungeon.